It's really difficult to find an image that suits Ted Hughes's bayonet charge um, because it's a poem that's just about a single soldier and a terrified one at that. And if you search Google Images, you'll see uh, bayonet charges like this one, which uh, focus no doubt on the heroism of the men. And uh, you will always find photographs of men charging together as a unified force. And uh, that is indeed the way we normally think about armies. But uh, Ted Hughes has flipped this and focused solely on the individual. And the rest of mankind um, falls away. And in many ways, this becomes a nature poem. I'm going to offer you several ways into the poem, and we're going to begin with enjambment. Uh, this is where lines um, don't make sense on their own. You have to continue to the next part of the line underneath in order to make full sense. And uh, writers, uh, especially poets, often do this in order to create a sense of surprise. My rather scruffy notes here, uh, looking at the syllable pattern, um, show that there isn't really a pattern in this poem. Uh, there's no rhythm to the syllables, and uh, these numbers aren't repeated um, properly in either of the stanzas. We might argue from this that uh, this disjointed poem is about the disjointed experience um, that war provides. Here we can see that all the lines of the poem make sense on their own, apart from this one, which employs enjambment. Uh, so here we go. That dazzled with rifle fire, hearing. And we're just left with the idea of sound. Uh, there's a kind of dramatic pause here with the end of the line, and we want to know what that sound is. We'll see later that the next line tries to actually recreate the sound of bullets um, not whizzing by but thumping by as though the air itself is being punched bullets smacking the belly out of the air and it's this sound uh, that uh, the soldier hears that first starts to change his view of war to move it away from that idea of patriotism towards self-preservation in the next stanza, again, we find these lines make sense on their own, uh, apart from this one here. Um, listening between his footballs for the reason, well, what reason, of his still running. Uh, pausing here on reason um, leads us to the double meaning of the word. Um, reason here means cause but also reason means the ability to think clearly, the ability to reason. And at this moment, when he's risking um, his life, possibly convinced that he's going to die, he has a kind of epiphany, an insight into how horrible, but also how pointless war is. And that comes from the enjambment here, which forces us to pause on the word reason. Of his still running... And his foot hung like, and again the enjambment here asks us to pause on the word like. Effectively, um, Hughes is slowing down time here, just as time is slowing down in the soldier's mind. His foot, although he's running, indeed probably as fast as he's ever done, running for his life, um, actually hangs suspended a moment in time. It's as though he can think... Uh, in slow motion while his body is moving at speed and it emphasizes the fact that his body is like a statue because his mind is racing so fast ahead of it. In the last verse or stanza we have this line here where the enjambment expresses the soldier's horror and uh, that horror is provided in the image of the hare which crawled in a threshing circle its mouth wide Again, we pause on this image of the wide mouth. Um, you might see it as symbolic of death, uh, a mouth wide in terror, or a mouth wide uh, ready to swallow the soldier up in a way, as death probably will. When you write about enjambment, you're also writing about the structure of the poem. Uh, and that's why I've begun 
uh, with this technique at the beginning because in any exam writing the structure of the poem is the the aspect that you're likely to deal with last and therefore least well. So I thought I'd start with that um, to give you a grounding in it. Okay, well my next way into the poem is by looking at simile. And uh, poets use simile when they want an analogy, a uh, comparison to say one thing is like um, something else. Uh, this is especially important, I think, for Hughes in a war poem, where what's being described is outside our common experience. And so Hughes needs to find a way to give us access to something that we can't experience or fully understand. And uh, possibly he does this so well because his father lived through the First World War. And this may be, although there's no proof, this may be uh, a poem based on his own father's experiences. The first simile we come across is the idea of his rifle. Um, we would expect a rifle to be useful in battle, but here it isn't. It's going to be used merely as a way to transport a bayonet. In other words, he's got to charge across no man's land with no enemy to shoot at and just hope that when he arrives, if he arrives at the enemy lines, uh, he'll be able to kill his enemy uh, with the bayonet at the end of his rifle. But the word lugged here suggests that the rifle is a useless weight and actually he doesn't imagine that he'll ever get to use his bayonet um, to save himself. The rifle is numb, so this is metonymy where you use um, uh, objects to represent um, something else. Here it's the, um, it's the feelings of the soldier. So actually the rifle isn't numb, it's the soldier who is, and perhaps his arm that's numb from carrying it. And it's numb as a smashed arm, again suggesting how useless um, this equipment is. The rifle isn't going to save him in any way at all. And probably when he reaches the enemy lines and tries to um, stab um, an enemy, he'll simply be shot. It's at this moment that he realises that the war is pointless. Uh, he begins by charging with a patriotic tear, as though he's charging um, to protect his country. And the tear had brimmed in his eye. That's what he was feeling. But now, that tear itself is sweating. It's no longer a tear. It's become molten iron. Um, imagine molten iron on your skin. It would burn right through and it's gone to the centre of his chest, to the centre of his being, suggesting that his whole being has been transformed. Indeed, this would kill you. Uh, and so this act here of charging in the bayonet charge has actually killed off his former self and uh, given him an entirely new persona through an entirely new perspective of the war. The next simile shows us that this perspective isn't welcome. Uh, he was running like a man who has jumped up in the dark. Uh, so he suddenly realises that his old self, the patriotic self, was in darkness. Uh, this is a metaphorical idea. Um, he was no longer seeing the light, the truth if you like. Uh, but he's now jumped up, realising his former state of ignorance and running hopefully, um, towards light and understanding. Well, this, of course, is entirely ironic because what he's actually running towards is the enemy lines, uh, an enemy intent on shooting him and, indeed, killing him. Perhaps it's for this reason that time suddenly slows. His foot hung like statuary, like a statue in mid-stride. Uh, on the one hand, this shows how fast his mind is working in comparison uh, to the speed of the body. But on the other hand, it shows his immense vulnerability. No matter how fast he runs, uh, to the German soldiers, he's going to be virtually a static object, easy to shoot. And uh, that's easy to imagine. If this is the enemy line down here, 
and somebody's running as fast as they can this way, from the enemy gunner's point of view, that person might as well be in the same place because the bullet only has to take that path and will kill them. And, you know, multiply that by thousands of soldiers and you can easily see that no matter how fast they run forward, they're actually stationary objects, at least until they get to the enemy lines here. The contrast with darkness occurs in the next simile, uh, where the light is provided by a flame. But here the flame is a yellow hair. Um, remember I began by saying this is almost like a nature poem, and so the horror of war is not conveyed by um, the dozens or perhaps hundreds of men he sees being killed around him as he charges. Uh, he completely ignores the death of the men. It's not described. But he notices uh, the suffering of this yellow hair that's uh, run up and then crawled about in a threshing circle, presumably because it's got nowhere to go. It is going to be shot or perhaps is already dying. The flame itself is not a peaceful light, it's obviously a violent one, one that could burn um, the observer. It's out of control, this flame rolls about, um, and that conveys the danger that the soldier is in. Again, it's ironic, he's seen the light as it were, he's seen how pointless um, this battle is, how pointless the war is, but that realisation has come too late he's probably going to get shot anyway, um, and that's certainly his belief. Uh, then, the final simile, he's dropped, like luxuries, all these old beliefs, a faith in fighting for your king, fighting for your own honour, being a warrior, fighting for the honour of your country. Uh, he's no longer fighting for human dignity because he has no dignity himself. And then this final word, etc. A throwaway kind of idea suggests that um, all of these um, abstract ideas that people were fighting for were actually worthless, just words in a list like etc. is. These are all things to be rejected. So the similes of the poem give us access to um, the soldier's changing viewpoint and realisation that the war is wrong. The next technique that uh, Ted Hughes uses is the use of metaphor. Uh, this is slightly different from the use of simile um, because it doesn't work purely with analogy. It now says, uh, this is the new reality. Um, the way that metaphor does that is it says one thing is something else. Yes, it's a comparison, it's not literal. But the way the language works suggests that... Um, it asks us to imagine that it's literal. And that's why reality changes. So there are lots of words that work in a metaphorical way here. Um, so how is the, um, the soldier raw? Well, he'll have raw emotions. In other words, they're intense. But he is also himself raw, perhaps young. And we also associate rawness with the state of meat. And this is a metaphorical use of the word here. Um, he is simply meat. He's no longer human. Uh, he is meat carrying a bayonet, charging with it across no man's land. But the moment he's shot, he becomes meat again, less than hu human. Uh, he's disposable, and the war is going to dispose of him. Next, we have this metaphor of the bullets smacking the belly out of the air. Um, I've mentioned the way this tries to recreate uh, that sound of bullets hitting the air, not whizzing, but uh, uh, punching the air. However, it's not people that's being um, murdered here. It's as though nature itself is being attacked um, by the bullets. In other words, war becomes unnatural, a crime against nature. Um, nature itself has a belly, just like the humans do, just like the men, and so Hughes is also trying to show how um, vulnerable each of the men are. 
we can imagine them all being shot in the belly because that would have been the height of the machine guns. The soldier is so terrified, or perhaps has such tunnel vision, that he doesn't notice all the men around him being shot. Uh, we do, through the poem, because, um, because of their absence, actually, because they're not mentioned. But the absence for him is he's purely focused on his own survival, um, his own belly, if you like, and so there's an element of um, delight, which is why we have the word dazzled here, um, that it's the belly of the air that's getting hit and not his own. This metaphor is often more difficult for students to understand. Uh, so the clockwork of the stars is the idea of fate. Um, so the idea that... Uh, our fate is mapped out in the stars. This is the same idea that leads uh, people to believe in horoscopes and uh, that you can look at the alignment of stars and draw some sort of conclusion about what's going to happen to you. Uh, in this poem, what's going to happen is entirely fate. We're all just part of a clockwork and that fate doesn't care for us, which is why the fate is cold. Uh, cold clockwork, it doesn't care what happens to us. But then the metaphor changes. So this fate isn't uh, something perhaps controlled by God or that sort of supernatural higher power. It's actually a fate produced by nations. Uh, so suddenly we see mankind being the victims of the countries they live in. Patriotism just becomes a form of mind control. Patriotism is cold clockwork that forces people to give up their lives for a purpose that they think is higher, dying for their country, but is actually pointless because they've lost their lives. And this realisation here comes in the question that he asks himself, was he the hand pointing? So suddenly he imagines himself as the hand of a clock ticking away the clockwork of his fate and it's ticking away towards his death and that death might happen at any second it's imminent the emphasis on second doesn't just show how soon his death might be but also how pointless because in the next second someone else will be that hand that gets shot and then the second after that, someone else. The clockwork keeps going because there are so many soldiers to become the hands of the clock. Um, but with each second that passes, a new soldier dies. And that's how the movement of the hands clock represent the pointless sacrifice of the men. Our final two uh, metaphors are very interesting. The furrows of the earth threw up a yellow hair. Um, well, metaphorically speaking, the furrows are nature itself, the land, but they're being sick. They throw up. And that's one reason why the hair is yellow. Um, so war itself is a kind of sickness, and we see that it causes nature itself to throw up, to be sick. Well, that's not the primary meaning, of course. Uh, the primary meaning of threw up gives us the um, motion of this hair jumping up from a furrow in the ground, trying to escape the bullets. Um, yellow uh, doesn't just represent the sickness here, but it also is um, an image of cowardice. You know, if we say someone's yellow-bellied or yellow, uh, that's what the expression means. And this cowardice perhaps reflects the fear of the soldier, um, or we might um, go deeper and think of it as the cowardice of the nations, the politicians who have sent these young men to die in their place. And then finally, we have this uh, metaphor that ends the poem. So to get out of that blue crackling air, his terror's touchy dynamite. Uh, this is really interesting because uh, it can be read several ways. His terror is like dynamite because it's his terror that's going to make him get to the enemy lines and explode at the Germans. In other words, 
it shows how violent his emotions will be. Um, he's carrying his ben, uh, bayonet. He's literally going to stab as many people as he can. Uh, and so he becomes dynamite in that respect. But, looked at another way, the dynamite of his terror is actually going to cause him to die. Instead of um, preserving himself, it's making him charge straight at the enemy lines. Um, and so it's going to blow up and kill him. And then there's a third uh, possibility. He's going to survive the war, and his survival itself will become dynamite. In other words, the um, soldiers' views will be changed forever, and those views will have uh, far-reaching consequences in the future. He's going to change how his son views war, for example, um, Ted Hughes, and Ted Hughes himself is going to try and persuade us, the readers, to view wars as against nature and horrific. Uh, so we might see the power of dynamite um, suggested that way. And then finally, it shows how dehumanised the soldiers have become. They are now simply weapons. They're not people, they're not even meat, as we had at the beginning of the poem, uh, they're just weapons uh, ready to kill. Right, another way into the poem is to consider its symbolism. Um, symbols are very important to poets. Uh, we could argue that all poetry is a search uh, for universal truth. Uh, that's what makes them different from novels or other kinds of, kinds of writing. Uh, poems want to be timeless even if they're set at a particular moment in time, as this is set in the First World War, they want to reveal things about um, human nature and the way people behave and think that is true in all times. Uh, so looked at this way, the symbolism is about war in general um, and the desire um, to defend one's country. Uh, everything here, um, in the, at the symbolic level, uh, will suggest that war is wrong, and indeed patriotism might be wrong. So at a symbolic level, when the soldier awoke, he literally um, wakes up, but symbolically something much deeper is happening. He wakes up while he's running at the enemy, and so this is a clue that um, his old self that thought war was glorious, um, something that he must do to serve his country, uh, was like being asleep, and now, at the moment when he's facing not only his own death, but the idea that he might kill other people, is when he suddenly had his eyes opened. He's now awake. As he stumbles across a field of clods, clods here mean uh, mud, and it's trying to recreate the muddy condition of no man's land. However, a double meaning of clod is a stupid person. Uh, so he could be looking around at uh, many stupid people, i.e. the other soldiers. And why would they be stupid? Well, they are now a field. In other words, they're dead. The bodies of the dead are now a field of clods. And of course, he is simply one of them. He's just as stupid as they were until this moment when he's suddenly woken up from that stupidity. Uh, then we have this ironic symbol here. Um, the hedge is green, and this is something that's supposed to um, signify new life. We're used to the expression, green shoots of recovery. Um, this is an image of renewal. However, this is the very thing that's going to kill him, because that's where the Germans are hiding and shooting from. And then we have the symbol here, of the patriotic tear, but tear is also um, a homonym, uh, it's the same spelling as tear, and so this is the moment at which um, his patriotism doesn't just lead to sadness with the tear, but is actually torn, so he is torn away from his patriotism, he no longer feels patriotic. We've already discussed the symbolism of clockwork here, this idea that destiny is controlling him, 
or actually the politicians who rule nations are. And we've also discussed the symbolism of darkness, how he is now um, moving away from having his eyes shut to having his eye open. Um, and then the furrows of the earth, these are man-made furrows, this is how the earth has been farmed, but again, this is ironic because the earth hasn't been ploughed here. It's been ploughed by shots. In other words, each shot travels in a straight line just as a plough would. And it's uh, smacking um, through the air so that the air itself becomes furrowed like the earth is. And this is what gives us the idea that war isn't just an attack against men. It's an attack against nature. I've talked about the symbolism of yellow and um, throwing up, but now we get this hair moving about in a threshing circle. This again is ironic. Threshing is what happens when you harvest the wheat, which obviously gives us sustenance. This brings us new life. But it's also the um, process by which the wheat is uh, sorted out from the chaff. In other words, the seeds are sorted out from the rest of the plant and the rest of the plant becomes debris, becomes rubbish um, in the same way that the hair itself possibly becomes rubbish here it's uh, just going to be killed and in the same way that the man who's watching it um, will also become rubbish if he gets killed he's simply just another victim another useless um, plant if you like that's feeding the wall. And then of course the hair itself uh, represents um, not just nature uh, but all the men. Uh, none of the men are dying in this poem. Clearly they are being killed but the soldier ignores them. It's only the plight of this hair that can still capture his attention. It's as though the killing of real men has no impact on him whatsoever because he has seen it hundreds and hundreds, perhaps thousands of times. And so through this symbolism, we can see how he has been fully dehumanised. Uh, he's no longer like a human being himself. He's simply dynamite, as we looked at before. But... He also has no human feelings anymore. He can't feel for his fellow man. Our final way into the poem is through its sound. Uh, it's always important to remember when you're studying a poem that they're meant to be read out loud. The experience of hearing the poem is part of its meaning. And uh, typical uh, techniques that poets use are the alliteration, the assonance, sibilance and onomatopoeia. I've colour-coded them here so you can see um, which uh, techniques I'm talking about. In blue I've highlighted the sibilance, the repetition of the S sounds. Um, and I think we can uh, see an awful, a huge number of these. And one of the effects of the sibilance is to slow down time. The S's, when you pronounce them, force you to speak more slowly. Um, this is crucial to the poem because at the moment that the poet awakes in... Uh, sorry, the soldier awakes in his terror, suddenly time slows down, even though he's running um, towards death, either his own or the Germans that he's going to kill. And we've talked about how slowing down time allows him to change his perspective, but also allows us to see him as vulnerable. Um, he can be shot at any moment, and the slower he moves, the more likely that is. There's a less alliteration in this colour here, um, and alliteration is normally either to make something memorable or to recreate the sound of something, and here the onomatopoeic sound, b, b, uh, kind of reminds us of the, um, the sounds of bullets being fired, as well as the rush of um, the bullets going by. 
which is picked up with the sibilance. And the green here is to remind us that um, it's an onomatopoeic effect that's being created through the sibilance and the alliteration. The next stanza is very similar. Uh, we can see sibilance uh, in every line, uh, again slowing down time because the soldier has become like a statue, uh, frozen in time, but also um, so easy to be shot. And then we have an onomatopoeic effect here, um, the shot slashed furrows, um, the uh, sibilance here again is the sound of bullets um, rushing past. The alliteration here of cold clockwork, and I should have highlighted the C sound here and here, is harsh sounding, um, and that links of course to the harshness of fate and the harshness of the rulers of nations who have sent these men and boys out to die. In the final stanza we notice far fewer examples of sibilance. Uh, time is therefore speeding up here. Uh, it takes less time to pronounce the words. They're not slowed down by the poet because he's getting closer um, to the enemy lines and his terror's getting greater um, and there's far more action in um, this stanza than the previous two. Uh, we can also uh, look at the onomatopoeic uh, effect of crackling. That's the, the air, the sound of the air, um, almost as though it's full of static. Not just um, the bullets, but perhaps the poet's or the soldier's own thoughts seem to be making a sound in the air now. The air is crackling um, with his ideas, not just with the threat of death, but his view of the pointlessness of war. The alliteration in the final line, his terror's touchy dynamite, uh, has a final sort of sound to it, as though an ending is coming, either for the soldier himself or for the people that he's going to kill. Either way, death is the ending, and it's a harsh sound with these short t sounds that um, he deliberately finishes on. And then finally, an example of assonance, where the vowel sound is repeated. Open, silent, its eyes um, standing out. So we've got the I in silent and the I in eyes. Um, this is because I means I the person, um, and that it's the eyes of the hare that the soldier is looking at. In other words, he sees himself in the hare. The, the hare which is threshing around in the circle is exactly the same as the soldier. In this case, the circle is charging from his line to the enemy line, and then, if he's lucky he gets to charge back again to his own lines, having accomplished his mission. Um, that in itself is a circle, if you like, which is a threshing circle, one in which he's being threshed by the bullets. The bullets are actually going to um, kill as many soldiers as possible, and only the seeds um, will survive. The soldier himself will become a seed, if he survives the war, because from him new life will come. And that's uh, another clue that perhaps Ted Hughes has written this about his father. Um, so Ted Hughes is the product of that seed. So what I've tried to do with, with the analysis of this poem um, isn't just to show you lots of different ways in um, into bayonet charge, those ways in will also serve you in the study of any poem. Um, you can go in looking at the similes or the metaphors, the sounds, the assonance, alliteration, or the symbolism. And they all bring you back to the poet's point of view. And here it's been quite clear, this is an anti-war poem and even an anti-patriotism poem. Well done if you've stuck it this far. You're guaranteed, I'd say, to uh, 
get the A star if you've understood everything. And if you haven't, re-watch the video and make sure you do. Please subscribe if you'd uh, like uh, more videos. And uh, good luck in your exams.